Hey everybody, welcome along, welcome back to this uh, to this Saturn V build. And now I'm looking at this. This is part three, and now I'm looking at stage two in the uh, in the in the, the rocket. This is the part that's going to sit up, up on top of stage one, and um, basically we've got four major parts here, four main components. Um, where is it? Here it is. So we've got the two halves, and we've got the upper and lower sections there, the bulkheads. Um, bulkheads are here. I've held the parts together and I've managed to see that you can actually get them in afterwards so we don't need to worry about putting them in now. So it means we can get inside and get our glue in there and everything. Um, so you don't need to glue those in now. Um, there are some marks you want to clean up in this area here. Uh, it helps to just get those gone now. Um, there's also some flash. I've just noticed some more there. But that can be cleaned up afterwards. Um, but yeah, we've got some problems with, with these parts. The, the pins and the holes on them cause the parts to be misaligned. And um, one is like this and one is like this. So they, we need to do some uh, stretching and springing about to, to get them uh, to fit properly. But it's no big problem. So if you're wondering what I've done here with all these little blocks of plastic and everything and just tape and everything, look back at part two and you'll see when I started doing the, uh, the first stage, um, you'll see what this is all about. So... That, that tape has now served its purpose so it can go. Um, if you did watch and listen closely on uh, in part two when I was doing this with the tape, I said one of the biggest problems with doing these, um, these plastic lugs to get everything to align is if the plastic thicknesses are different, what will happen is it will cause it to be mismatched. If, if, this, if, if this section of plastic on this side is, is thinner than this section on this side, obviously if you with these lugs you're basically making the, the, the insides lock together obviously they'll be like that and they need to be like this so what I've had to do is with these lugs I've spaced them out with 10 thou card and then with the opposite lugs I've put 10 thou card on top of them and then you'll see that what we can get here is a a nice fit all clips together and um, it, we've got a nice flush um, I was going to say fuselage there. We've got a nice flush cylinder that all matches up and everything. And then of course we can glue it and tweak it and put some tape on it and everything. Oh, and the other thing to mention is um, these faces were covered in ejector pin marks, which will stop it going together neatly as well. So it's worth um, worth looking at them and getting rid of those as well. So um, it's always the same with these older kits. Whatever it is you're building, always look. Uh, you know, modelling. When these kits were made, modelling was a, um, models were a toy. It was a, a, men didn't build, I mean, habitually, men didn't build models back in those days, I don't think. Um, I think it was basically, you know, I can certainly remember getting pocket money and running down to the local sweet shop and getting a, an Airfix Series 1 kit off the rack, you know, that came in the bag with the paper header. And I think that's what modelling was all about in those days. These days it's come on more and more as the uh, young lads have grown up and it's become more of an adult hobby I think I'm not sure kids are that interested in it these days we, we need to get them more interested but the way the price of kits are going I don't think that's going to happen so um anyway so yeah this this stage two we've got nothing to line it up um this way so I need to just do all that visually but um you know what I'm going to do is concentrate on the inner areas and make sure this is all lined up because we can always sand the end square but getting this to, to, to match up won't, won't be good at all and I think I can probably get some um, little clips on there to pull them together and then as you can see um, this part here goes in the bottom we've got these two lugs in the way but what you can do is put that in there and then squeeze that out around and that'll just pop in like that so that's that one in squeeze it out around take it out and this one will actually go in and swivel um, like, hang on, there we go, oh it's stuck on, I've put a lug there and that, that may well get in the way so I may have to cut it out after it's, um, after it's uh, glued together but uh, I'm going to try not to, but I need that lug there for, for some support on this top edge while it's all gluing and it's no good relying on these bulkheads for support because as you can see they're all loose so I could line them around with some plastic card but uh, I'll just, um, I think I'll just do it this way instead. I've also stabbed myself, if you can see there, I've got some blood on my finger. 
So um, there we go. There's the uh, that's the stage two. So now we need to get on and get this all glued together. Um, I want to make sure it's all beautiful. And what I'm not sure about if I can use these little um, bulldog clamps on here. I'm not sure they'll stay. No, they won't stay on there. What about a bigger one. Find a larger one here. I don't know if that will stay on there. No, that won't stay. So I'll have to find some other way of holding that together. But um, there we go, guys. That's uh, that's stage two. So I'll get some glue on that now and get it um, together. In fact, I guess you may as well watch. Um, as I did with stage one, I'm just going to glue one side at a time. So I'm going to get some glue in here. Get some glue into this joint here, there's plenty there. And then see if I can give that a, a squeeze together. You can see there how the inside and the outside miss a line. So that's what, that's what you're taking out with your uh, little lugs. So yeah, there we go. I've got that to basically want the upper surfaces to align and ignore the inner surfaces. So you want to step both ways. You don't want to step one way and not the other. So I think what I'll do is get some more glue onto this joint. You can see the capillary actions pulling it. The joint's just being great at pulling the glue away from the brush. Bink. There we go. That's got plenty in there now. Give that a squeeze and you can see the glue coming out. There we go, that's that side done. I don't quite know how I'm going to get this to go together. Um, looking for, I don't know if one of these reverse pegs will hold it. Nope, that's going to spring off. Um, sorry, those are not the camera then. I've got some uh, different type clamps here, like this one. I don't think that's not going to hold it. Oh, yes, it does. That one's holding it, look at that. Great. So that's holding it together and the glue is oozing out. So I'll get some more glue in there. Don't want it coming apart after all. Worst thing you get with something like this, as big as this, you, you need very, very strong joints because if you pick it up and give it a little squeeze and the joints are weak, you'll just snap them. So uh, what I'm going to do now is get my paintbrush again. Once again, my little humble paintbrush. And just brush some glue inside all around these lugs. And that will make sure we're all nice and solid. Pretty much guaranteed then this, it's not going to come apart with this in there. There we go. Get those out of the way in case I drop some glue on them. And there we have it. So that's that side glued. I think I'm going to put a drop more on that end. In fact, I'll take that clamp off. I think I'll brush them along there. Just to make sure I don't get a dry joint. It's one of the great things of working on something as simple as this. If you've got like a like a 70 second scale aircraft and you've got joints or panel lines everywhere, you've got to be careful of them riveting, you don't want to damage, then uh, you've got to be more careful with the glue. But with this, you could just chuck it on, as Ted says. So I've got some masking tape. Again, cheap masking tape. I'm not going to waste money on Tamiya tape for this. And then just pull it together. There we go, that's gripping there now. I'll just put a piece across there. There we go. 
that's that side taken care of and I think I'm gonna to have to leave that there because I don't have another one of those clamps like that and this one definitely this side definitely needs clamping so what if I want is I just put a bit of tape on there for now to hold it together so that it sets the right position and just check it's all it's not that one it's this one just check it's all round still Why is that not good? There you go. Yeah, that's lovely. So I might as well leave that in there for now. So there we go. That's uh, that's the first part of stage two done. Right, that's had about uh, an hour to um, start to set now. So I'll get this uh, masking tape off of this other side. That go in the bin over here. And then get that crocodile clamp, or bulldog clamp off of there. And um, that's all gone together, lovely. So we need to get this all glued together now and make sure it remains true. Um, what you don't want to do is glue it together like that. So make sure that the all of the um, features all stay in line and everything, and that everything is good. Get our tab here extra thin. And begin the process once again of putting about three gallons of the stuff into these joints. So I'm going to pinch that together now. Let's see what happens. Yeah, we got a we got a nice joint there. You can see what I'm doing. I'm just scratching what little nails I have got. I'm scratching them over the surface. I want to feel a step both ways. If you don't feel a step one way, like if you, if you can imagine, if you get it like that, you won't feel a step going that way, but you will that way. You want it to be all nice and flush. So put some more glue in there. In fact, I may as well just get a big brush and go from inside. Rather than waste time with the little one, just go straight for the straight for the main man, in for the kill. Get all this welded up together. Just a thought: if anybody out there um, has a Revell Germany 172nd scale space shuttle with rocket boosters they want to sell, let me know. Um, I can't find one for love and money. There's a couple of the ordinary ones about without the rocket boosters, but I want the uh, I want the one on the stand, like Phil Flory built. So if anybody's got one um, and they want to sell it, let me know. I'll do a review, I'll do a build, and I'll do some updates on it. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to. I've got a one forty fourth. On the back of a 747, which I haven't built, um, which is in 144 scale, but I'd rather uh, I'd rather do a 70 second scale and go to time with the with the detailing. So if anyone's got one, and they're well, probably best you're in the UK because the postage to send that across the pond will be uh, crippling, I should imagine. But there we go, that's that done. And we can feel that joint, it's nice and parallel, nice and smooth. I'm just gonna put some more glue there because it's not got enough on it. We need to make sure this is absolutely thoroughly solidly welded together because there's a big mismatch on these parts. And they are gonna want to come apart, I think. Um, I think I'm tempted to put a rubber band on this uh, on this one end to try and keep it um, parallel. Yeah. I want to keep that there so there's no step in it. The 
doesn't want to play ball by the look of it. So what I need to do there, this is a little trick for you guys, to get a cotton bud or something. Something round, stick it under there, like that. And that'll help to bias that that way because it wants to it wants this side wants to pop out. So there we go, that's lovely. So I can get my cheap and tacky masking tape again. And get it on that side, stretch it nice and tight across, take that there. And the same on this one. Take that there, get it all taped together. And that's lovely. Just check this end. Hasn't got any mismatch. See the mismatch is on the inside, but the outside is correct. does just need a step on it there we go that's better so there we go that's stage that's um stage two roughly uh roughly together and again that needs that needs a good long uh, while to dry out because it's got a gallon of, of um tamia extra thin in there so that's going to need a good long drying time. Okay, so there we go. We've got stage one uh, assembled there and done with Sprugo, as you saw in um, in part two. And then in this part three, we've got uh, we've got this um, second stage up together, and you can see we've got our our lattice work inside there, which is making it all nice and strong. And if you remember, we spaced it all out so that everything's nice and even. Now I've noticed the same on this on this stage two as we had on stage one. One side is okay. This side is kind of, it's difficult to show you because it is confounded white plastic, but it kind of comes up like this round and then it's flat. So I'm going to put some sprugo on that area there just to give me something to work with. So we'll do that now. Um, if there is a downside to sprugo over filler, it takes longer to dry. Um, but but the benefits way out, far outweigh the... Uh, the negatives, the positives outweigh the negatives, should I say, because it's some, um, you know, it's such a it's such a good means of filling. Because as I said, not only is it f in part two, not only is it filling, it's also bonding, and um, it's 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 if you like, it's strengthening the glue. It's like it's it's almost like adding weld to a to a thin sheet of metal. You know, it's um it's actually welding it all together. So. I've just got some of that on there now and I'll leave that now to dry for a few hours before I start to do anything with it. But what I'm going to show you today, what well, is today for me, it's these video parts, although it's part one, two, three, you, you see it as sort of, you know, a half hour, hour long video, whatever. For me, it sort of can be you know, three to five days. Um, so basically, I've got this one here. There's no sprugo in that area. There's sprugo in that area, and what I'm going to do is just take off the top. So, what I've got here is a wide flat sanding stick. I get these from um, Models for Sale, the, the company, of, you'll find them on the internet, and they sell a lot of different, well, they have a lot, have a lot of kits, but they do a lot of different tools and accessories, and they do some, they have some quite interesting sanding sticks that I don't see anywhere else. But these, when they come, they're new, they're white. Um, if I can find one to show you, I will. Um, this is what you're looking for. This is a brand new one. And when they come, they're white. And as they wear out, they go black. So I like to use them when they're a bit worn out for stuff like this. For stuff like this, they're really good for like resin and stuff when, you, when you're sanding back the plug. So, um, but they do, a, they, they do a very unusual range of sanding sticks that I've never seen anyone else do. Where I've never seen anywhere else. So these are really good. And what I'm going to do with this is I, what I'd like to do is go at 45 degrees, but I can't. In fact, what I will do here, it's a good tip for uh, for anyone really, is protect this area here 
from errant strokes of the sanding stick. So I mean, it's not going. If I go sanding on it, it's just going to sand straight through. But if I just knock into it, it will protect it and save me taking the edges off. So what I like to do is, is go at 45 degrees and go like this. But I can't because of that detail, so I have to go at 90 degrees. But what I'm going to do, the correct way to sand a circle, I was taught this at Rolls-Royce. A lot of people don't do this, but the correct way, if that was in a vise, is like that. I'm trying to show you on the camera on the right angle. It's like that. If, if, you, were, if, if you wanted to sand this round yeah, with a file, you do this. You don't do that. You do that. And uh, that, that's what... Um, that's the correct way to do it. So you would basically be doing this as I'm doing here. And that was basically just going to take off the top. Now, I'm not going to be doing this because it's an awkward technique. And to be quite honest with you, without a voice, it's quite difficult to do. So I'm just going to. I just want to take off the top. I'm not looking at getting a good finish. But I'm taking off the top and I'm just checking to see the sprue glue is ready to be rubbed down. If it starts to tear, stop, walk away and uh, go and do something else. And there's plenty on this kit to get along with. I mean, I've done this now. Now I can get on with um, step two. Or I can start on the lunar module or something like that. Um, I don't intend to have lunar module in this, but I'm going to build it anyway. Because uh, I know you guys want to see that. But it's in this particular kit, it's a little bit toy-like. Um, I'll build it anyway. I'm going to move over to the course side. And you can see what I'm doing. I'm turning and I'm rolling my hand and I'm turning at the same time. So you can see it end on. I'm doing this is what I'm doing. Exaggerated. So as not to get a flat spot. And then what I'm going to do is move on to sponges. The sponges are great because they won't they won't produce a flat spot either. So there we go. I can do that like that. Now, what I can do here is get my pencil and go around the edge like so. And then I know that when I've got through, then I'm on the uh, on the plastic. So here I've got a sponge. I think again this comes from um, Models for Sale. So I've got this fairly coarse-ish sponge. In fact, no, I won't use that one first. I'll use this one. Flory Models, um, great sanding sticks. Have a look on his site, he does a starter set. And this is a, a fairly coarse, soft sponge. So as it goes over, what it does, I can show you on this pencil, it, it compresses and it will form itself to the shape of the, that you're sanding. It's not as good as some of the softer ones, but it's a good start because you don't want to go straight in with your soft, soft sponges. Um, because you'll just end up replicating that shape. You'll end up with that. So I'm just going to sand away at this. I'm not putting any pressure on, really. I'm working into that corner. As you can see, it's coming down and the pencil marks are starting to disappear. So I know that I'm getting it blended. And this is actually um, the day after. I did this sprue goo yesterday. So it's had about 24 hours, 22, 24 hours. So it should be okay. And remember, the reason this is in here is because this area was flat. So if I try and blend it in perfectly, I'm going to end up with the flat again. So what I'm after doing is, is just making this section round all the way instead of going round, flat, round which is what it was like before. And now I've got another sponge. Um, and I'm just going to, this is a bit finer. I'm just going to work at that. Work at that joint. And there we go, it's starting to come down. And then I've got another sponge here. And we really are starting to get there now. I'm 
sorry about that, I don't know if the mic's picking it up, but my washing machine's on in the background, so if it starts to spin and it's got a misbalanced load, if you hear like a dung 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 in the background, it's not somebody I've got locked in a cupboard, it's the washing machine. The people I've got locked in the cupboard are quiet. You know, I feed them well, so they're, uh, they're pretty well behaved. Right, so um, that is pretty much that, and I can still feel it, but I'm there ready now to start thinking, and you should be careful on this end, that you don't end up rolling over and end up sort of tapering that in. Um, that is ready now. What I intend to do is give that a, a, a spray of with some paint, and then I can use the paint as a guide coat so that I can see what I need to be doing. So I'm going to do the same thing on the rest of this. Um, in fact, what I'll do is I'll show you this side because I started this side, didn't I? So we'll get this done. Again, I'm just taking the top off. Here, what happened here, I was stupidly, I had a, it wasn't a string, it was a, like a lump of the sprue goo pulled across and I got my finger and wiped it away. So I ended up with a divot. Um, if you get that, leave it, let it cure, and then you can just sand it out. But I was stupid, I, I pulled it away, not thinking. In fact, it may even be on the video. I'm not sure. I'll have to go back and have a look. But yeah, going, here we go again. Going through the sticks. And rocking and rolling. Making sure we stay on that circular path so we don't end up with any flat spots. Start there. It's another bit of sprue glue there. I don't know if any of you guys watch it, but there's a there's a channel on uh, YouTube called Vintage Space, and it's a young lady. I think her name's Amy. Um, she's got a couple of channels actually, and fantastic. Go we'll and have a look. Really, really good. Really informative. Um, well, it is to me because I'm a newbie. I don't know much about it, but what she says on there, I, I'm taking in, and and it's um. I find it all very, very interesting. She may be incorrect on some stuff, I don't know. I, I doubt it somehow because she's so confident. But, um, yeah, I really do. Uh, there's one she does on there about it taking, she starts off, it says it takes five engines to get men to the moon, yeah? Pointing at the uh, the J1s, the F1s. And uh, no, it actually takes 86 or something. So uh, that's, that's quite an interesting video. And you'll learn a lot about the staging as well if you don't know about it, like I didn't. And probably still don't. I need to watch it again, I expect. It's fantastic stuff. So, so yeah, go and have a look. Vintage Space, the channel's called. She's got thousands of subscribers. She must earn a fortune of all these different channels. But, uh, I've commented on a couple of times and um, no response, as, you do, as, as usual, with these big channels. But, um, yeah, really, really good. So there we go guys, I'm sort of pretty much there now, and like I say, ready to start using a guide coat. I don't want to just start sanding, because this is white plastic, you, it's very difficult to see what you're doing, and for all I know I could be putting a massive flat on there about that wide, um, or like a you know a hexagonal sort of shape. So I'll put a guide coat on there that I can work with, and then I'll be away. Uh, so I'll get the rest of this done, and then I'm going to start looking at how to do this. So what I'll probably do is do do one or maybe two sides and then show you how I've done it. Um, rather than have you watch me experiment in the wrong way. There's no point showing you the wrong way. I'll tell you the wrong way, but there's no point in me doing a half hour long video on, on how to do it wrong. <laughs> that's, that's pointless. Right, so I've got my guide coat painted on now. It's just green because I've got loads of green. Um, you can use any colour as long as it's, you can see it over the white. So what this will enable me to do now is I'll be able to sand away and see where any low spots are. So I'm going to take this sponge, which is um, fairly fine. It's probably about, uh, I don't know, 1200, maybe a 1, thousand grit. And just gently rub away in the circular motion again at that paint and just rub away to get the, the white showing through. And I think maybe this is a little too fine, but I'll carry on anyway. So I'll move over to this one, which is probably more like about an 800 grit. So 
so um, just lightly sanding, no pressure, and then we can see from where the where the paint remains on the surface. Don't worry too much about getting into that corner for now. I'll show you that in a minute. But we can see where the paint is removed from the surface, and you can see it's starting to blend here. Again, being careful of this edge. You don't want to be ending up putting a taper in there. So just going round and what I'm, I'm wiping the sanding stick on my jeans and that cleans it out. And then just rubbing around, rubbing around, making sure I'm not putting a flat spot on there. And I'm just going to keep going until that green around the edge of that sprue goo disappears and then I'll know that it's all blended. Now you can see these little spots in here that show me where there's low spots and I can come in afterwards with some um, Mr. Surface or some filler or some thick paint or something and just fill those in. And the other thing to be careful of if you find yourself rubbing away for ages you may be that the actual sprue goo is undercut on the side. And we can go, keep going. As I say, don't worry about getting right into the corner. I'll show you how to do that any second now. And there we go. I'm concentrating on this side now, this this side here, to um to get that edge gone. And if that line doesn't disappear any minute, I'm gonna. Put some Mr. Surfacer over it just to make sure it's not um, undercut. And then just going to concentrate on this end and make sure I don't put a taper on it. If you start going over the edge, you'll, you'll put a taper on it, you'll put a radius on it, you'll make a right mess. And the, where it joins onto the next part, it'll look terrible. Okay. So I can get my finer stick now and just give that a polish and we can see now that that area is cleaned up and you can see where I said there was a flat spot you can see particularly here where the sprue goo has remained over the joint so that is kind of almost like a, a layer of plastic over the joint rather than a layer of filler over the joint Okay, and this one, this fine sponge is so fine, you don't need to worry about this, all this rotational stuff. Um, you can, uh, you can just sand away it because it's what it's basically doing. If you look at it, it's it's making the shape anyway, and it removes such a small amount of material. It's not, uh, it's not of any real concern. I'm going to remove the pressure from that end. I can still feel there's something there. going to sand away and normally if you if you stay 45 degrees to the to what it is you to the joint it would be a lot better but here unfortunately you, you can't because you've got these raised areas so there we go I'm quite happy with the way that's gone. So I'll get the rest of this done now and then we'll go on to the Mr. Surfacer. Right, I've brought you in a bit closer so you can see what's going on here, plus I can then work on the bench without having to lift in front of the camera all the time. So we can see here we've got these spots. That's showing us our low spots where we need to do some fine filling. Um, I'm going to use Mr. Surfacer. You could use sprue goo again, you could use filler, anything. Um, I like to use Mr. Surfacer because it brushes on. I'll show you in a minute. And I've also got some scratches here from where I used my coarse sanding stick to get rid of those, um, from that lot of undulation and scuff marks in there. So we've got some fine scratches in there that I'll paint over and then they'll disappear under the Mr. Surfacer. Into the corners here, what we could do is just sand away and sand away and we'll end up removing some of the detail on these, this rib section. So to get into that corner, there's two ways to do it. You can either use a rounded blade like this one or you can use a flat blade. I'm going to use a flat blade for this first of all and then I'm just going to using the end of the blade just run along and I'm keeping the blade 
flat to the surface and I'm just using it as a scraper and getting into the corner like you can see there so until I see the green paint gone and then I know that I've produced a sharp corner that should be there that there is like a lump on the um, on the plastic from the spoogoo so I'm going to get my blade go in there and just slice that lump off like so okay now to prevent this what you could do is put tape just over the edge when you do your sprugo, peel the tape off before it's set and then just deal with this little area afterwards um, if you're not too you know if you're not too confident that's probably the best way to go with a radius blade with a round blade what you can do is just get into the corner and just roll it along like that to scrape it and if you do this before you do your Mr. Surfacer, then you can brush the Mr. Surfacer and sand out after to make sure that it's all okay. So I'll do the same on this side. This time with this blade, I'm just going to go in, push into the corner, and just scrape the blade along until the green paint disappears. I can also scrape along with this one, just to make sure that I've got a nice square corner in there. And then again with this blade, nice and flat. Keeping the blade flat, just scraping along. I'm not removing great chunks of plastic, I'm just literally rubbing the surface. Same here. You can hear the step. So what I can do is just carve in there and get that step away. I'm going to come this way, so you can see that, that is a very good way of getting into that corner and giving you a sharp, a sharp edge. The idea of this is I don't want anyone to be able to pick this model up and say that was where the seam was. And finally, this last bit. There we go. So, sand and stick, just in the corner there. A couple of gentle rubs, just to clean out any marks that might have been made by the knife. There we go. So I'll get some Mr. Surfacer on here now. Right. I've been asked in the past um, what I use to clean my brush for Mr. Surfacer. I don't. When I use my last session, I just wipe it off in a cloth. I don't clean it in anything. Um, <clears throat> sometimes it's actually really, really stuck up and uh, just a solid lump. The thing is, as soon as you put it in the Mr. Surfacer and you brush it around in there, then it just becomes a normal brush again. So, <clears throat> excuse me, there's no need to start wasting thinners and stuff and, and clean, to clean your brush with. Just leave it on there and then when you use it again, it will just, um, it will just soften up. So just brushing it into the corner there brushing it out here and what I'm going to do is go a little bit wider than I normally would just to make sure we cover the edge of where the sprue goo was because you know you may have attacked the plastic slightly there may be a little mark from where there was a, a little drop or something going into that corner nice and sharp brushing it out Concentrating on the joint, like so. And I'm going to put a little lump, little dollop there where we've got that low spot. And I'll work around it because the Mr. Servicer may well shrink. And then here, where these sanding marks are. I'm just going to very lightly, well, just going to brush them on and brush it out thinly. Doesn't need much. There we go. So that's that area taken care of. 
same on this side. Now you can see I put it on here where I probably don't really need to, but just in case. Can't go wrong, you're not very, putting very much on, so it's not being wasteful. And then we need quite a bit there, quite a bit there. There's some marks there. And don't forget, you'll also have imperfections in the actual plastic. You know, marks in the mould, or even... Um, in fact, I'll brush that out thinning, then I'll brush some more at that seam. There, where those divots were. Yeah, you'll have um, sink marks, you'll have scratches on the parts, scratches in the mould. You know, the parts could have got scratched when they were in the box. All sorts. So, brushing it out. Put plenty on where you've got the low marks. And there we go. And that, my friends, is that. So when we come back, and that's dried, I'll um, I'll sand that out some more, and then you'll uh, you'll see your uh, seamless joint, and you can go and have a go. I mean, this would actually be a really good kit for beginners because it really tests your uh, your skills, and it's not expensive. So, um, and also, you know, with this, you, you because it's white, you, you can do it, and if it doesn't look right, you can rub it down and start again, and, and not sort of, you know, worry too much about fancy camouflage colours or fancy metallic finishes and, and stuff. So, um, and I'm still working on these nozzles, I'm trying to get them perfect. I've just put a tiny little slither, another, another slither of filler in them, and um, I'm trying to get them perfect. I don't know why, it's because I'm me. I suppose it's crazy really <laughs> but um anyway so uh that's that bit there i wait that wait for that to go off and then i'll show you me um how i rub that down but like i say don't bother cleaning the brush with your mr surfacer just brush it off like that put the lid back on one wipe of a cloth and there you go brush clean we've got stage one here with the uh, Mr. Surfacer drying on, ready to be uh, sanded down. We've got stage two with some sprue goo on it, and I've got some Mr. Surfacer over these streaks. I've got my jet nozzles here, or um, sorry, F1 engines here, which are uh, I've put some more Mr. Surfacer in them just to get them um, absolutely spot on. And up here we've got our command service module, which has got the end all sanded down. I've actually ordered some. Um, some magnets now so um i mean today is what's today wednesday the first of may so hopefully by tomorrow they will have arrived and i'll show you how i'm going to use those so i'll just put a screw uh, i'll either put the magnet in there or i'll put the screw the magnet in the actual um command module and put a screw in there just so it holds it down in uh, i may even put a magnet in both so they pull together but then I might not be able to get it apart. That's the trouble. It depends how good they are. So um, I don't need it to be like, you know, really in there solid. I just wanted to hold it down against there. So um, that can be dealt with later. Um, so moving on now. So we, because we're just waiting for paint and glue to dry again. Um, I want to be looking at the uh, stage three, which is called S4. But uh, it's called stage three. And this one's got the single J2 engine on it. And uh, this is what the, the front of this had the, the cone on it that carried the lunar module and the um, and all the controls and everything. I can't remember there's a ring that holds all the uh, the controls and everything, which weighed about four thousand pounds, I think. Um, so basically, uh, we need to get these two halves together and get these two ends in and get this um, this uh, this J2 engine together. So here are the parts removed from the sprue. The J2 engine is a lot easier to deal with than the um, than the F1s because it's got the um, because it's got the cone already moulded in there, and all I need to do is remove this lug here from the uh, location peg, and then I can just put some Mr. Service in there, sand it with a cone, and we'll end up with a nice finish inside there. Um, beware, we've got ejector pin marks all over it again. So we need to make sure we get rid of them to make sure it all goes together neatly. And the location pins on here do actually allow it to go together. So 
it is very simple but it'll look quite nice sticking out of the sticking out the back of that one um i do intend to have all this removable so i can show people you know how it broke down i'm not really too worried about stage one and stage two coming apart we'll, we'll see about that so um these two need to go together and i have had a check this uh, at the end of this tank that will go in easily once they're glued together this one's a bit more tricky um it's going to have to be slotted up inside on an angle from the back and then um up from here and in there and then using a, a pen or something something long is tip it over um, in fact i'll do it now and show you grab a pen so i can tip that edge up so that it sits above that flange in there and then move the pen over whoops get that to go up over that flange like so and then get this edge up and it will just clip in yeah it came apart there but it does go in I've checked it holding it together and making sure it doesn't move so it will go in after so I'm going to do that um, and when I say it will go after I mean it will go in after if you're building this and you want to build along with me perhaps hold off until I've got all this together and all dried and everything and then we'll try it then um, just to make sure I don't want you to make the same mistake as me um, and this one goes together actually quite nicely and I'm not really going to worry too much about putting too much in here in the way of lugs I think I might just put a couple um, just sort of one there and one there one there and one there just to give it a bit of um, a bit of support because it will be handled but because it's so much smaller in diameter it should be a lot easier to deal with and the plastic is is equal thickness so um, all I need to do on this one is I won't bother with any tape I'll put a line there a line there line there do the same on this side like so and then I'll put um, I'll put across there and across there and across there and across there and then I know that I need to where I need to put those tabs so that they'll all line up so there we go guys I'll get those tabs on and then I'll come back to you once I've done that one other thing I want to show you um, if you look at see where this line here is that's where this oxygen tank or this tank sits and then the the next stage goes on there with the um well the lunar module actually sits in there doesn't it and so if you look down in there you'll you'll see there's actually um a big ejector pin mark and the number in there so um you really want to be scraping that out so i'll just go over that with a pencil like so so that you can see what i'm talking about down in there ejector pin mark at the number 24 so i'm just going to get an ordinary radius blade and just lightly scrape away at that area just get all that gone it doesn't need to be perfect um, it certainly doesn't need to be perfect on my model because I don't think I'll be having this area exposed although we'll see maybe I'll change my mind it really depends how well those um, cone parts fit together if they fit together and look pretty seamless then uh, I may well have it like that and then I can um, like I say when people visit I can show them show them how it all comes apart and I believe out of all the uh, kits available I think this is the only one that actually allows you to to actually open up the four flaps in, in like in the real thing and have it coming apart I also read quite interesting from Apollo 13 on the, the ones that the, the ones that got into um, moon orbit before that were just allowed to go off into the uh, into the atmosphere um but the apparently the um there's another mark now we want to get rid of um apparently from apollo 13 on uh, stage three was actually sat on a trajectory to crash into the moon and then the instrumentation left from uh, apollo 12 which was left on the surface of the moon was um was able to pick up the shot wave left behind so I don't quite know why I need to do some research into that um, I need to find out why they did it but uh, yeah and then apparently um, the other Apollos then all did the same um, but apparently Apollo I think it says Apollo 10 uh, stage 3 is still in Earth orbit so still going around above us it, all those uh, 
many thousands of miles an hour. I can't remember if it's when this when this actually launches. Um, uh, off of the when the stage two separates, I think it's going at is it seventeen thousand miles an hour or one hundred and seventy thousand miles an hour or something, and then um, and then it has another blast to get it into the into the moon. And uh, to, to, to 24,000 miles an hour or 240,000 miles an hour. Somewhat stupid, ridiculous, ridiculous speeds. Uh, and faster than a Ford Mustang. So, um, right, so those lugs are on now. So we can give them a just a little trim to make sure they go together nicely. Just remove. Those little bits. Like so. And now these should clip together. Like that. Lovely. Then what I'll do, I think, once it's all glued together, these pegs and pins in here, I think I'll probably remove them. Um, because if when you look down in there where the lunar module goes, I don't want to be able to see those. So basically, let's get this uh, glued together. The same issue on here. Look, it's coming out to a to a point rather than carrying on round with the radius. So um, let's get this glued together. The other thing I haven't done is check the uh, the CM. Yeah, we've got ejector pin marks, so need to get rid of them. Make sure we've got a nice flat surface to glue together. And again, with this one, we've got the pins on one side and holes on the other. So need to be careful not to lose those pins. I'm going to get my large flat sanding stick. And just sand away until that ejector pin mark is gone. In fact, I'm going to put some pencil marks on here. And on here, and then you can see what I'm talking about. If I give it a gentle rub. You can see the marks on there that are still there. You don't want them still there. You need them to disappear. There we go there. And we've got some on this end as well. So uh, they're not going to help with your assembly at all. And we've got some on this half too. So if you are building this kit, guys, be very wary of these ejector pin marks. They seem to be, a lot of them are slightly raised. And they seem to be, so, so you can see them, I'll rub over there with a pencil. There you go, you can see it there, and then the same on this side. If I lightly sand it, you'll see the, you can see them there. So yeah, you want to be careful of them. Um, I expect the 196 version is going to have them as well. But uh, yeah, be careful because they're raised and they will affect the way it all goes together. But, um, that's just one of the things with these old kits. It's, uh, it's not a whinge. And as I keep saying, you know, for what this kit costs, it's an absolute bargain, really. Absolute bargain. So I'm going to get my extra thin over now. And I'm going to go in with my long brush again and glue it all from the inside. So plenty of glue, get plenty of glue in there, splash it all on as Ted says, chuck it on, I think is what he says isn't it, not splash it on. And then with that brush just put some on the outside of there, give that a squeeze together. And because this one is such a good fit compared to the others, I don't need to worry about doing one side at a time or anything, I'm just going to do both at the same time, put the glue on the outside of there. And then plenty on the inside, plenty around those lugs because they're going to help get it all welded together. And there we go. Give that a bit of a squeeze. I should be able to get a couple of um, clamps on there. Yeah, they'll stay on that one. Like so. Clamp them together. And then once that glue's had a few minutes to go off, we can work on the top and get some tape on there. In 
fact, what I'll do on the top, I'll put a rubber band on there. Double it up. Oops, the clips come off. There we go. Get the rubber band on there. And I've touched that glue that's used out there. And that's good to go. That's that's going to be great. In fact, I will just put some masking tape on the joint. So just pull the tape there, and then just pull the tape there. There we go. And that's that. Now then, this engine. This will be it for uh, for this step, I think. Um, again, we've got these ejector pin marks in here that I want to get rid of. I've got a bit of a sprue over there I want to get rid of. Same on that one. And then, yeah, that's actually part of that. That's not part of the sprue nib on the side there, that piece. That is actually part of it. So um, what I am going to do is remove that pin from there. And cut away that lug and cut away this lug from inside here and then I'm going to use my knife just to pare that away this blades getting a bit blunt to be honest this is when you run the risk of cutting yourself using blunt blades so don't do this at home kids get rid of that number 22 in there Coming 22, your time is up. And then 21 can go as well. Just give them a quick squeak. We're not really too worried. We're going to do a lot of sanding in here anyway to thin out the edge and everything. So, um, yeah, these ejector pin marks, I want to make sure that they're not proud. And they are actually undercut, so they're okay. And they're the same, they're undercut as well. So I'll just give the surfaces a quick sand over with a sand and stick just to make sure there's no massive irregularities in it or anything. So a bit of a sprue nib on that peg there. So we'll get rid of that. Let's just quickly give that a sand. Yeah, this is a bit uneven on you. Yeah, there's ejector pin marks there that I hadn't seen. You can just see them there showing up in the silver light. Sorry, silver in the light, should I say. I'm about to have some on here too. Yet yeah, we have. So there we go. Blow them off. Hold them together and they should go together beautifully. Yep, yeah, so I'm going to get a clothes peg. And lock them together up there. And I've got another clothes peg ready. I'm just going to check before I glue it. If I put a clothes peg on it, will it make it go over? Yes, it will. So that one's a bit too strong. I'm going to look for a weaker clothes peg. I can't find one. I need an ordinary soft wooden clothes peg. And I've converted them all into the hard one, so I just have to hold it for the glue to dry. So to get some extra thin again from the inside. Plenty on there. Plenty in there. You can't have, well, you, you can't have too much, but uh, just make sure it's flooded and make sure you've got plenty of glue to hold it together to give you that weld action. I'm going to take this clothes peg off so I can get around on this end and get this all welded together. There we go. So that's all held together now beautifully. Like so. And that's that. And I need to go and try and find a weak clothes peg. I couldn't find a clothes peg, so I had to use one of my uh, crappy pound saver uh, elastic bands. Which is also good because it holds it together. It helps hold it together while you do all the sanding work. That's why I've left the sand. Oh, that one's come off. Look, as I said, these things just fly off. There it is. That's what happens to these elastic bands. They just decide to come off because they're rubbish. Um, so I'll put another one on there. But uh, 
Yeah, they've got these on there, all just hold, helping hold it together while all the sanding work is being done. So, I think we'll call that a day for part three. No, we won't. Right, yeah, I was going to call it a day there, but we'll just get this rubbed down and then we'll call it a day from there. And uh, next time then I'll show you about getting this painted to make sure it's actually so we can see that it's seen free. So, um... So basically, I'm just going to restrict myself to these sponges now. This is the coarsest. This is the next. This is the finest. So I'm going to start off with the orange one. Well, I, actually, I'll just give it a very light rub, very lightly, with this one, just to take off any high spots. The risk of sanding down straight away with a very fine sander, if you've got... That's still not dry there. If you've got... Um, If you, if you go straight in with very fine, you run the risk of actually sanding around it. You, you, you can actually, rather than taking the top, the best way to describe it, if you can imagine, if I had a little metal ball bearing there and it was glued down and I got a hard block and just sanded and sanded and sanded, it would sand the ball bearing away. Whereas if I used a soft sponge and sanded and sanded and sanded, the, the, the ball bearing would, would go into the surface and I would be sanding around it as well. So, which is why if ever you want to sand away, like if you do a stone chip on your car, put a drop of paint in there, let it go off, put another drop in there until it's slightly raised, and then get some 2000 or something wet and dry, worn out the better, on a little block of wood or a little block of metal or something, and just very, very gently rub away until you see the lump disappear. And then when you polish it with some tea cut, a rubbing compound, whatever, you haven't sanded away the paintwork around the outside of it. So if you're trying to remove lumps, go hard. If you're trying to keep it soft, uh, like produce radiuses and not, um, and not flat spots, go soft. So there we go. So I can just go over this now. And I'm not trying to tell you how to suck eggs, guys. I'm just trying to help the the beginners out there. You've got to remember, there's some modelers out there, uh, beginners that that don't particularly have a, a practical job. They may be um, shopkeepers. They may be uh, you know, they may be dental assistants or whatever, and they may not have had the kind of practical background upbringing that the likes of myself and some of you may have had so we have to make sure on the channel that we cater for everyone and explain it for everyone and you must also remember there might be some proper young you know youngsters watching this who are going to take every word i say as gospel so i have to be honest upfront, and straight and there we go so i've just rubbed that away but now i can get the really fine sanding sponge and just gently go around. I'm still following a radius, if you notice. And just go around like such, like so. And there we can see that there's basically nothing left, so I know we're okay, and all I've got is a little bit left in there. So I know now that that is basically seam free, and the fact that it hasn't got a lot any left in it, it means I'm not gonna get any sinkage. But you know, you need to be a little bit mindful of that, of the fact um, and beware that um, where you have got any filler it may sink so be careful and even, even with, with the sprugo in there it still may sink so we may get a line up here but um, it's not a major issue because it's white so even if a line does appear it probably won't be very visible white is the best color to uh, if you're going to have a seam appear white is the best color because it'll be less noticeable than if it was black say and that is the trouble with trying to show you guys what's going on with white plastic. Um, it's, it's extremely difficult because it doesn't show it doesn't show irregularities or marks as well as every other colour does. So there we go. I've sanded that down now, so it's pretty pretty much. And you can see these sanding marks that I put in with the uh, with the sanding stick earlier. They're starting to appear, and I can rub them away. And when you've got a dirty thumb like this, you can rub over and just check they are gone. And there we go. And now I can come over with the fine sponge and just go over there. Like so, and you can see that low spot there that was, if you remember. I'm just going to make sure I go over that with the 
because I don't want to have them like I said with the ball bearing I might end up with a little race spot there so just rubbing away not pushing down at all just letting the letting the block do the work you can see here where these sanding marks are the Mr. Surface are staying in them they've got these little sink marks here that's probably where there's oh no I thought that might have been where there's um, um, you know the, the, the pins where you have the, the pins and the lugs inside the part um, that's often like, like these here that's often where you'll get a sink mark so we can see there that the Mr. Surfacer stayed in those sanding grooves so they're all flat now and then on the back of this sanding stick this is quite coarse but the back is very fine it's like a like a 2000 grit almost so I can just quickly go over with that sounds like it's got something in it sounds like it might be scratching so I can just quickly go over with that get into that corner like so and then like I said earlier I can get my knife I use the curve blade this time and I can just literally using the weight of the knife just rub around there literally I'm not you can see I'm not even pushing the knife at all I'm just using the weight of the knife letting it go in and just removing the Mr. Surfacer from in that corner you can hear there's a step there which I want gone there we go and then same in there just get with the corner of this one You can see these sanding sticks because they're new, they've got a nice sharp corner on them. And there we go. And then what I can do then is get an even finer sanding stick like this one here and using it wet. Okay, so going in with this one wet. Just sand away. Get my cloth. Just dry that off to remove any of the the dirt that I've just put on there, I've got some overspray there. Let's just get rid of that. And there we can see that is our our joint now. Now this is the special treat, guys. Using the white side here, just using it wet. Now this is removing nothing. This is just polishing. And what I can do now. You'll hear it start to work and you can feel it and then it might start to squeak. When it starts to squeak, that's when I know we're done. Here we go, it's going to squeak any minute now. And it's a good way of looking to see how the seam is looking because, like I'm going to try and show you, it looks like we're not going to get a squeak. there we go now if I can get this in the light because it's polished I can catch it in the light we can see that we've got no seam okay I wish I could get it so you could look along it there we go so you can see look along it in the in the, uh, in the light you can see there's no seam Okay, and when that's painted white, I can assure you that will be completely invisible. This side hasn't been polished. I'll just give this a quick polish. It would be better to show you this side because it's got less filler in it or anything. Just clean the end of the sponge off. You don't need to worry about your sanding patterns with this because it's literally taking nothing off it, it's just polishing it. Ok, 
Okay, so this one will probably be better to show you. See on there, no joint, if I can get it in the light like that. Looking down on it, it's like looking down the back of a airliner. So you can see that, although you know the seam is there, there is no seam. It's invisible. And as I said, I mean, if you were spraying this gloss black, it would need to be absolutely perfect. But because it's going to be matte white, it doesn't matter that much. So there you go, guys. That is how to get a seamless joint. So we'll call that a day for uh, for this one, for, for um, part three. I think it's been a little bit shorter than the others, but that's not a bad thing. Um, I'll get on now and do some more on this. Get these... Uh, rocket engines finished and then we'll go from there and I'll show you what I'm going to do with this one the next time you come back I'll have that full of Mr. Surfacer and it'll be dried and then sanding it I'll sand it first in fact I can do that for you now on on, the, on camera I'll get a little cone of my 240 grit look at it ice cream cone and then just push it in there and sand away until we can get rid of uh, most of the rubbish that's in there and the horrible marks I'm not going to go too mad because I don't think the glue's set yet but you get the idea so I'll do that get it all kind of smooth paint some Mr. Service there and then polish it out again and I'll come back when I'm ready to polish that so that'll be uh, part of part four and also I'm hoping that in part four we can finish off the inside of these and start to work on the outsides but um, you can see they're looking lovely so uh, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Please like, subscribe if you like this. And if you've got any suggestions for any future content, any questions, you can email me, um, nigelsmodelingbench at gmail.com. And any comments or whatever, put them down below. But hit the notifications bell and you'll get notifications of when I put new stuff up. And as I say, very soon we'll have a review of the Real Space Models um, commands, uh, Command Service Module Kit and also full review on the new wear uh, set which is 200 and odd pieces so um i'll see you all soon guys thanks for watching stay tuned